Hello and welcome to the Windows Scope Student Series Tutorial, Introduction to Accessing Windows Kernel Structures. In a traditional Windows-based system, the kernel is the lowest layer of software that interacts with hardware. It is responsible for many vital system tasks. This includes memory management, thread scheduling, hardware abstraction, and security enforcement. Windows supports two processor access modes, user mode and kernel mode. In user mode, user applications are run at a limited privilege level. In order to access any of the kernel level data structures and functions, control must first be transferred to the kernel. Within Windows Scope, we can see many of the structures and files that perform these tasks. In order to communicate with the kernel, user processes import functionality from the subsystem DLLs. Some of these are kernel32 and kernel base. These are visible as modules for many processes. The final intermediary between user and kernel mode is a library named ntdll. This contains functions that translate user requests into a language the kernel can understand, and can be seen under the symbols tab for many modules. The executable NTOS kernel receives these requests and contains much of the functionality for performing kernel tasks. Service requests involving hardware interaction are processed through the hardware abstraction layer and HAL.dll. We will explore this process in more detail as we progress through this tutorial. We will now examine how Windows Scope displays kernel structures. Upon system startup, a privileged executable named WinInit.exe is run to instantiate the kernel. This file can be seen under the Processes node in Windows Scope. Within this process, we can see two important DLLs, kernel32 and kernel base. These libraries hold the functionality for initializing the kernel. This includes setting up paging, virtual memory, and interrupt handling routines. For example, under the Symbols tab of kernel base, we see RTL Create Security Descriptor which initializes a security descriptor used for holding information regarding who has access to the object it is associated with. The kernel performs interrupt handling by utilizing a table stored in system memory space, which is only accessible while in kernel mode. This table, called the interrupt descriptor table, can be seen by clicking on the IDT folder within the OS structures node. The IDT contains a list of pointers to all of the interrupt handling routines within the system. When an interrupt is encountered, the operating system enters kernel mode until the interrupt is handled and then returns to user mode. The pane on the right now displays a six column table. The entry field of this table is used to index each of the 256 table entries. Of these entries, the first 32 are reserved for processor exceptions, 16 are reserved for hardware interrupts, and the remaining 208 are for software interrupts. The type field denotes whether the interrupt is classified as a task, interrupt, or trap gate. A task stops the execution of the current process by initiating the execution of another, allowing the new process to have exclusive rights to the processor. When the process called by the task gate has finished, control is transferred back to the original process. An interrupt executes a segment of interrupt handling code and disables further processor handling of hardware interrupts. A trap is similar to an interrupt but does not disable additional hardware interrupts. The target address and target module show the memory location and module in which the interrupt handling routines are stored. The target function field displays the name, if possible, of the function being called for interrupt handling. Due to the fact that rootkit and malware writers frequently target these kernel level data structures for malicious purposes, the hooked field is shown. This field indicates whether or not the IDT has potentially been hooked by an attacker. It should be noted that this field is only active in the enterprise and law enforcement versions of Windows Scope. If we look through this table, we can see that the majority of interrupt handling routines are located within the file ntoskernel.exe. We can view ntoskernel by expanding the drivers node. Once the kernel has been instantiated and initialized at startup, this process contains most of the kernel's functionality. If we look at the symbols tab for this process, we can see that many of the imported functions come from the file HAL. HAL contains the functionality for the hardware abstraction layer and allows the kernel to communicate with the system hardware. Some recognizable functions include HAL enable interrupt and KE stall execution processor. <laughs> 
It is important to note that the prefixes ke and hal are some of the kernel level function prefixes and that all functions that are executed from kernel mode reside in system memory space. For example, in ke stall execution processor, the kernel stalls the function caller on the current processor for a specified time interval. The function hal is hyperthreading enabled is used to determine if hyperthreading is currently enabled on the machine. With hyperthreading enabled, a single physical processor may be divided into multiple logical processors. Although all logical processors share the same execution unit within the physical processor, each has its own CPU state. This allows one logical CPU to make progress while others are busy, causing overall performance enhancements. So now we have seen that the kernel must import some functionality to operate properly, but how can user processes interact with the kernel in order to request system services? The answer lies in a kernel structure called the System Service Descriptor Table. The contents of this table can be seen by expanding the OS Structures node and clicking on SSDT. The SSDT is a table of pointers to functions exported by the kernel, used for completing system calls at the kernel level. The five column table in the pane on the right displays the same fields we saw in the IDT, including entry number, target address, target module, target function, and hooked. Notice that the kernel exports many of these functions directly from ntoskernel.exe. One example is ntlock file, a routine which is responsible for requesting a byte range lock for the specified file. When a file is shared, byte range locking is used to protect specific regions of the file, preventing multiple processes from writing to a file at the same time. Another is ntopenthread, which starts a new thread of execution for the calling process. NTQuery EA file is used to read the extended attributes from an NTFS file. Some typical uses for extended attributes are storing the author of a document, the character encoding of a plain text document, or a checksum. At the bottom we see NT shutdown system, which will shut down the operating system. Windows Scope allows you to see how different structures interact with each other in order to complete system service calls. To demonstrate this, I will start by selecting the process iExplore.exe. Under the Modules tab, we will see all of the system DLLs imported for the functionality of this process, as well as its executable image. For example, if we look at the graph of ieframe.dll, an Internet Explorer browser UI library, we can see some of the functions that are necessary to run the web browser. For example, Add URL to Favorites, i.e. launch URL or open URL. I will select this unnamed node, which I know contains some interesting functionality. The purple block on Windows Scope signifies that this function, open thread, was imported from a different library. We can see which library this is by going to the import address table IAT for IE frame. But first, we will take note of the function name and its address within the module. Looking at the IAT, we observe that open thread is imported from kernel32.dll at this target address. In Windows 7, kernel32 forwards this function call directly to kernel base to support backwards compatibility. By navigating to its IAT, we can see that kernel32 imports the function open thread from the library kernel base at this target address. This time, let's look at the code and see exactly what it does by navigating to the graph of kernel base. By searching through the list of functions here, we will find our function open thread. As expected, the address here matches the one seen on the IAT for kernel32. We see that the assembly code resides in a purple box, a call to yet another DLL. The name of the function being called this time is ntOpenThread. We will make note of the function's import address and navigate to the IAT in order to see where it is coming from. Here we can see that kernel base imports ntOpenThread from the module ntdll at this address. If we now go to the disassembled view of ntdll and find this address, 
we will see the instructions which are executed for ntopenthread. The EAX register is loaded with a system service number. In this case, the value FE is loaded and a system call is performed. All system calls are handled by the system service descriptor table. So let's look at the entry FE, which is 254 in decimal. Here we observe that the ntOpenThread function is called and that it is imported from ntoskernel.exe. At this point, the system will enter kernel mode. We know this because the address of the function is in the top half of memory, which user mode does not have access to. To see the code which is executed here, we need to go to drivers and look within ntoskernel for the target address given. Here we can see some of the instructions which are executed. If we were to follow all of these instructions, we would see how the open thread function is handled at the kernel level, and how the flow would eventually go back to user mode and return to the address where this function call originated. This concludes the introduction to the Windows kernel. Thank you for watching, and please view our other tutorials for more information on the important Windows structures and functions that can be seen through the use of Windows Scope.